Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 County TIF training at, here at the Office of the State Auditor. My name is Haley Rowan. I'm the TIF Administrator here at the office. So we have with us today Lisa McGuire. She is one of the TIF auditors and she is helping to organize this and she'll help answer some questions on the back end. Our state auditor, Julie Blaha, is planning to stop in to say hello after our break time. And our presenter today is Jason Nord. He is the director of the TIF division at the Office of the State Auditor. And I'm going to turn it over to him. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, well, we missed the chance to see and meet you in person. We hope that this live webinar format helps us to reach everyone who might find it useful. Um, my normal caution disclaimer related to the organization of this training is that for some of you, this may be very familiar and a refresher. Well, for others, this might be new and honestly a bit overwhelming. Uh, TIFF really isn't easy to distill into beginner, intermediate, and advanced segments. So be prepared that if it is overwhelming, that's kind of a normal reaction. Uh, and if it's not much new, I hope you still uh, find it a valuable refresher. All right, well, let's jump in and get started with an introduction to TIFF. Uh, beginning with the very basics, uh, first TIFF is different things to different people. Uh, it's a public financing tool for businesses and economic development professionals. It's a revenue type or fund for finance directors and the accountants that are often left to administer it. It's a feature of the property tax system for county auditors and affected taxing entities. Uh, and it's a statutory program uh, for the lawyers and oversight administrators. It's all of these things. Um, and the bod municipal bodies that use TIF are referred to as, as TIF authorities. So you'll hear that term a lot. Uh, cities and city entities such as port authorities, economic development authorities, or housing and redevelopment authorities are the most common TIF authorities. Uh, county and multi-county housing and redevelopment authorities or rural development authorities can also be TIF authorities. Uh, perhaps some of you are, uh, that are attending are involved in this context, but we're focusing here more on your uh, administrative roles as counties. Um, and there's one TIF authority that's a large metro township. The various development acts that authorize the use of TIF for each of these authorities are referenced here. And note that the TIF Act governs how TIF is used, but it's these acts that um, authorize authorities to use TIF. In 2019, there was 408 authorities using TIF, uh, including almost all cities over 5,000 and a large number of small cities. TIF was used by more than a dozen county entities. Uh, this map doesn't show the multi-county entities. Uh, but nearly two thirds of TIF districts um, by these authorities are located outside the metro area. Although 85% of the increment is generated in the metro where the values are higher and projects, uh, large projects are more common. There are five statutory types of TIF districts in Minnesota, uh, each with their own requirements and limitations. Redevelopment, housing, and economic development districts make up 97% of all the districts. There's also renewal and renovation districts and soil condition districts. Um, and there's also some laws uh, over the years that have been created uh, for unique uncodified types of districts. We call those uncodified districts. Um, and there's one type of sub-district that can be created within a normal TIF district to capture additional increment um, to address uh, hazardous substance sub, uh, remediation that might be encountered. As you can see here, um, redevelopment districts, which have blight tests and housing districts, which have income uh, limits can collect increment for 26 years. Uh, supporting broader economic development purposes is a debatable policy subject. So economic development districts are limited to nine years of increments and they're limited to certain sectors like uh, manufacturing. They can only support retail under certain small city exceptions. Uh, and renewal and renovation districts have a blight test that's more focused on undesirable land use conditions. They're limited to 16 years and soils condition districts uh, for the remediation of pollutants can collect an increment for 21 years. The development acts we previously noted govern the project areas in which development activities can occur, which are often larger areas than the individual developments supported by the use of TIF. Uh, TIF is created by using TIF districts or creating TIF districts that consist of the parcels on which finance development will occur. 
there can be many TIF districts in a single project area. So you might notice t uh, authorities name TIF districts in a manner like TIF 1-3 or TIF 2-1. Generally, that first number refers to the project area and the second refers to the TIF district in the project area. So like TIF 1-3 might be the third district in project area number one. Um, they're not all numbered like that, but that's a very common um, way they are uh, numbered. Um, now let's look at a more specific definition of TIF uh, and an, an example that will organize our looking into its mechanics and how it works. In this example, this old substandard commercial building is proposed to be redeveloped into some multi-unit housing with ground floor retail. Uh, the more complete definition is TIF is a financing tool where new value from a development is captured, so the property taxes extended on the captured value are segregated as tax increments that are used to pay the qualifying costs that enable the development to occur. Now, there's a lot here to unpack, so let's break it into its parts. Uh, the first component of this definition is that TIF is a financing tool. So it's worth noting that TIF is not an incentive that is a tax break or a tax reduction or a tax abatement. The taxpayers in a TIF district pay their full property taxes on the parcel, but the incremental taxes become a revenue stream used to finance costs. Um, obviously, the costs of a development are incurred at the beginning uh, and the tax increment revenue stream is collected over the duration. So this requires the use of debt obligations and there are several options that TIF authorities use. The most common type of debt, TIF debt obligation at 64% of the debt re reported for 2019 is the pay-as-you-go or pay-go note where the authority has an agreement to reimburse the developer, owner, or no note holder for the qualifying costs that the developer incurred or separately financed. These have become more popular over time because the risk is not borne by the TIF authority if the increments are insufficient to pay all the costs. Uh, general obligation or GEO bonds were more common in the early years of TIF. Uh, with these bonds, municipalities pledge their full faith and credit and have to raise taxes to pay bonds if the increments are not sufficient. Revenue bonds, which pledge only tax increment revenues or other revenues such as special assessments are less commonly used because they're less attractive uh, to investors who bear more risk. And many districts also make use of interfund loans where internal dollars are borrowed from what, um, one fund to another uh, in the municipality. And usually that's more to cover supplemental costs like administrative costs rather than being a sole funding source for the district. Uh, next, let's, let's look at the second part of the definition, this notion of capturing new value. Uh, in our example, the taxable market value of this vacant, deteriorated, structurally substandard building before development is just $200,000. The proposed development would be valued at $3.4 million after development. The, this proposed development would generate $3.2 million of new value that will be captured for TIF purposes. Uh, you may be aware that Minnesota has a unique property tax system that converts taxable market values to a measure called net tax capacity. Uh, and if you're new to property tax terminology, net tax capacity sounds weird and seemingly uh, is odd compared to taxable market value. Uh, it's named that way because in 1988, the legislature tried to define values so that they would be similar in proportion to desirable effective tax rates, tax rate amounts. Um, I'm sorry, effective tax amounts. And that's, uh, that's why it got the label net tax capacity. I, I think they hoped that high and low tax rates could be judged based on how close they were to 100%. Um, and it never really worked out like they hoped, but we got the label anyway. So in short, when you hear net tax capacity, just know it's a weirdly labeled term for value and that the, it's the value that's used to calculate rates and taxes. So. Anyway, in this example, the property has a before development net tax capacity of $3,250, and its after development net tax capacity would be $67,250. The new value, the difference between the before and after net tax capacities is $64,000, and that's referred to as the captured net tax capacity. Now, at the most basic level, property taxes are simply a value times a rate. The value starts with the assessor's determination of estimated market value. However, the existence of exemptions, exclusions, and value deferrals means that not all property is taxed at its full market value. So taxable market value actually becomes the starting point for two different types of tax bases. 
There's the net tax capacity uh, or NTC tax base. That's the main tax base. Uh, and it's determined again by multiplying those taxable market values times that class rate. Most states do have some form of ratios where say commercial, industrial uh, and residential property are taxed at different ratios. Most states call that an assessment ratio and just have maybe a few classifications, whereas Minnesota calls them class rates and there's over 50 classes and tiers. Uh, referendum market value is an alternate tax base for certain levies. Referendum market value typically equals the taxable market value or a portion of it uh, from select classes of property. So for example, farmland is not subject to RMV levies. Um, originally, uh, RMV was just for levies adopted for voter referenda, but now some referenda are actually levied on net tax capacity. And I'm not sure if non-voter levies are also levied on referendum market value, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, anyway, one more wrinkle, the state property tax is also levied on net tax capacity, but only for certain property types. So the tax, your tax systems will distinguish between local net tax capacities and the state uh, net tax capacity. Uh, at the reason why I bring all this up is because it's important to note uh, and perhaps relieving to know that TIF only captures value for local net tax capacity based levies. It does not capture the state net tax capacity or uh, affect the referendum market value taxes in any way. All right, so what does this capturing of value really mean? Um, when a TIF district is created, the value of the property at that time is certified by the county auditor as the original value or the original net tax capacity. Uh, and any increase in subsequent years uh, in the current value or the current net tax capacity over the original, whether because of uh, the construction of new improvements uh, or just improving market conditions or both, is defined as captured net tax capacity. So in our example, we identified that the $200,000 commercial building had a net tax capacity of $3,250. And let's say that the, um, this original net tax capacity was based on the 2020 valuation. So if for the 2021 valuation, no development had started yet, but the current value increased a little due to uh, economic conditions that made the property slightly more valuable, there would be some uh, capture of value. When the development is completed for the following year's valuation, there would be much much more significant capture of value, $64,000 in this example. Uh, it may be straightforward to understand that the increase in the value over the original is being identified as the captured value, but appreciating what it really means to capture value involves a little more explanation as to how capture affects property tax calculations. The captured value is going to impact how tax rates are calculated and applied. Tax rates are generally calculated as the levy that a local jurisdiction has adopted as the amount it needs in property taxes for its budget uh, divided by the total value in the jurisdiction. Because of TIF, however, the captured net tax capacity is excluded when calculating the tax rate. It's being captured from the tax base. Uh, so let's look at an example of this. Um, Let's say a jurisdiction has decided it needs to raise $900,000 of property taxes and it adopts that as the levy amount. Let's say the total uh, net tax capacity of the jurisdiction is $3,064,000, of which $64,000 is the captured net tax capacity uh, in our example TIF district. Let's look at the difference between calculating this rate excluding the captured value versus calculating the rate on the total value. Uh, the rate using the $3 million of value that's not captured has a tax rate of 30%. And when that rate is applied to the uncaptured value, it raises the full $900,000 levy that the jurisdiction adopted. But remember, TIF doesn't get a tax break. And so when the rate is also applied to the captured value, it raises the tax increment, which is $19,200 in this example. Had we used the full 3 million and 64,000 of value to calculate the tax rate, the tax rate would have been 29.373% uh, and applying this to the uncaptured value would only raise 881,190, which is short of the desired levy. Um, and when the rate is applied to the captured value, the resulting increments are essentially the rest of the levy amount. So the lessons here are that tax increments are additional taxes that are not part of any levy, and that if captured value weren't excluded from rate calculations, TIF would just be diverting or redirecting levy dollars away from their original budgets and into TIF projects. 
Um, and it's also important to appreciate that rates um, and taxes are higher while TIF is being used than what they would be if the TIF district was terminated or not needed. Now there's one more mechanical piece to cover. Property taxes are not just a value times a rate. Uh, there's also credits that reduce um, the gross tax to what the taxpayer actually pays. The gross tax includes both um, tax increment and regular taxes, so a credit proportionally reduces both. So if you see, you may see TIF shares of various credits, although honestly most credits don't apply to the types of property that usually are found in TIF districts, so there's not a lot of this. Um, and generally, the Department of Revenue reimburses jurisdictions for the amounts of TIF credits for 2020, they listed only 11 districts in eight counties, and other than disparity reduction credits, the amounts are really quite small. So now we uh, go back to our definition and our example. Um, in a TIF district, the original net tax capacity of the district is essentially frozen and remains the tax base for the purposes of calculating rates and supporting local levies for the entire dur duration of the district. And that means that the new captured value is not part of that tax base for the entire uh, duration of the district and does not support local levies for any jurisdiction. Um, and I, by the way, I say essentially frozen because although the original net tax capacity typically doesn't change very much, there are a number of adjustments to um, the original net tax capacity that you might have to apply for things like changing classifications or property going exempt or taxable or legislative changes to class rates and those sorts of technical issues. And we'll talk more about those later. Now, moving to the next part of our definition where we say that the property taxes on captured value are segregated as tax increments, we've already seen that the tax rate is applied to the captured value, creating the additional taxes above the local levy amounts. And those get se segregated as tax increments. In this example, uh, a total of $4,225 of taxes are levied on the original net tax capacity of the 3250. This, uh, uh, this is the sum of the individual levies by local uh, taxing jurisdiction, and these local taxes will largely stay consistent for the full duration of the district, you know, subject to your normal variations in rates and levies. Um, but extending the tax rate on the captured value in this example would raise 83200 of increment each year, and these are the additional taxes that finance the development costs, uh, which leads us to the next part of the definition. Um, tax increments are used to pay qualifying costs that enable the development to occur. Qualifying costs might include things like um, uh, costs for land acquisition, demolition, utilities, streets, sidewalks, uh, etc. The TIF is not is meant to be an enabling tool that addresses market failures or costs that serve as obstacles to free market activities. Uh, that's easy to see in the cases of redeveloping blight and developers tending to focus on market rate housing without some incentives to include affordable uh, units. Uh, the case for economic development is a subject to a little bit more debate, but the reality is some sectors like manufacturing, warehousing, and other industries are competitive and footloose, meaning they can locate in a wide range of locations, and so subsidies become an important factor for them. But TIF is not meant for developments that are likely to occur without the need for its assistance or costs unrelated to enabling such development. Uh, enabling the development is key. The central justification for the use of TIF, regardless of the type of district, is the notion that, but for the use of TIF, the development would not occur. Now, let's take a broader look at the TIF concept in economic terms. Uh, the general premise from its redevelopment origins is that the property might uh, a property might be blighted where its value is declining or stagnating, and this is expected to continue absent any public intervention or assistance. When a TIF district is created, the original value at that point in time is established or frozen as the tax base for the duration of the district. And with the public financing of TIF in place, development is enabled and the value increases as a result likely to grow over time. The TIF district will eventually end and it is at that time that taxpayers realize the public benefits of the endeavor as the new tax base is available to support local levies. The captured value that provided the tax increment uh, is generally viewed as the investment that makes the benefits possible. So they're not considered an economic loss given that the development would not have occurred without the use of TIF. 
One significant consideration, though, is that TIF is more likely to be positive or neutral the smaller the costs that need funding or the shorter the district remains in existence. So not every district needs to run its full maximum duration. If the district decertifies early, uh, once the tax increment, uh, once enough increment um, has been captured to sufficiently cover costs, then the benefits become available to all districts sooner. And this is actually the intent of the six-year rule that we'll be discussing later when we get to the topic of decertification. Um, and in fact, early decertification is quite common. Most TIF districts do not run their full duration um, based on decertifications that occurred from 2015 to 2019. 63% of redevelopment districts decertified early, as did 79% of housing districts. Uh, and not just early by a year or two, but on average by 10 to 11 years. Um, even economic development districts with their shorter durations decertified early 30% of the time. Um, and a little bit of this may be due to projects just not getting off the ground. Uh, and some of it is likely due to authorities choosing to end districts when the costs are paid but uh, some of this may be attributed to that six-year rule requirement, which again, we'll talk about later. I'm gonna spare you an extensive history lesson, but I believe a bit of historical context is helpful, so we'll quickly um, identify some highlights here. As TIF began in Minnesota, there was substantial early growth. The number of cities went from four in 1974 to 57 by 1979, and the increment went from 400,000 to 7.4 million. Um, each development act um, that had incorporated TIF had different processes and, and provisions, and counties and state legislators began expressing some concerns about the impacts they were having. The 1979 TIF Act brought uniformity and clarity to how TIF was to work, along with basic limitations. Uh, and this clarity of process, however, actually resulted in massive growth, and the concerns of counties and legislators can, grew with it. Um, from 1988 to 1990, there were major new TIF limitations imposed on TIF, and although the growth continued, it did so at a more moderate pace, and TIF continued to receive scrutiny from the legislature. Uh, the 2001 tax reform had two major impacts. Class rate reductions for commercial industrial property cut captured net tax capacity by about 30%, and the state takeover of general education levies largely eliminated the school aid interactions that had the legislature so concerned for years. Um, and with TIF no longer seen as driving up school aids, uh, legislative scrutiny waned a little bit as, mo as moderate growth continued. Um, changes to the TIF Act have been much less frequent um, or significant since then. By 2008, the amount uh, peaked and began to decline as a wave of decertifications began for those original large districts from prior to the reforms. Um, and it looked like we were leveling off here and reaching a potential equilibrium We've now seen a couple of years of increases, so remains uh, to be seen what the future volumes might look like. Uh, and in this course, we're not gonna go over all of the various restrictions and limitations that a TIF authority needs to be aware of. Uh, and this slide doesn't need to be fully digested, so don't cram for it, but it's just offered to visualize the general scro scope of uh, history of and history of provisions. The one piece that I will briefly highlight is the pooling limits. Uh, of the 1988 to 1990 reforms. Uh, arguably the biggest problem in the early years after the TIF Act was using pooling, which is the expenditure of increment outside the district, but still in the project area, um, along with plan modifications to expand the scope of TIF districts uh, to spend all the increment generated over the full duration of the district well beyond the originally proposed development. So to address this, pooling was limited to 20 to 25% of total increment. And uh, in addition, the five and six year rules were added to require that the identification of in-district costs has to happen in the first five years um, and require increment thereafter to uh, only be used to um, pay or set aside to pay those in-district costs uh, and to then decertify the district when in-district costs are paid. Um, I also want to note that we sometimes see various parts of the TIF Act that can be improved um, or clarified, and we have conversations sometimes with stakeholders about uh, TIF issues. And I'm looking into the possibility of creating a working group of interested stakeholders to participate in conversations on possible TIF law changes. 
and would love some county participation. So if that's something that interests you, uh, please shoot me an email or give me a call uh, or make a note on the course survey at the end. Um, so that would be uh, very valuable. All right, so that ends our first section here. Um, are there any questions about the introduction? If you haven't submitted them yet, go ahead and submit them by the chat um, kind of questions pane. Um, but uh, Haley or Lisa, have we seen any questions yet? Um, yeah, let's get the ball rolling with one. Um, how has the economic downturn affected TIF revenues? Uh, sure. Yeah, the the 2010, you know, the whole um, recession um, did re reduce the number of increments that were being generated, but there was also a jobs bill passed at the time that uh, allowed some special rules for more liberally generating new TIF districts, and that helped offset the, offset it quite a bit. Um, so uh, it wasn't a, a major swing, I don't think, or that we've seen. Um, and I guess it remains to be seen how um, the last couple of years here will impact things. Um, you know, maybe the, a certain, the uncertainty has tamped down new districts, but um, uh, we really don't have um, new data to see what's happening more recently. But um, I guess in short, there hasn't been major reductions, but um, there has been a bit of decline from that. Okay, um, that's it for now. So, excellent. Well, let us then continue uh, by uh, discussing the processes and considerations oops, that are um, at play when TIF districts are being proposed. Uh, counties have a role here. So, but first, just kind of the creation process. In, um, uh, it starts with the authority drafting a TIF plan. Uh, and then that plan must be given to the county and the school district to give them an opportunity to provide comment and feedback. Um, this must occur at least 30 days prior to a public hearing, uh, which is held after public notice, where the public can then also provide their comments and feedback. And after that hearing, then the municipality may approve the TIF plan. And to complete the process after it's approved, a request for certification of the district must be made to the county auditor, who then certifies the original value and gets it all set up in the tax system. So uh, copies of the TIF plan are also to be submitted to the Department of Revenue and our office uh, once it's approved. The TIF plan has statutorily required elements um, that generally include objectives, properties the authority intends to acquire, development activities for which the authority has entered into agreements or designated a developer, identification of other specific development that they reasonably expect to take place in the district, uh, estimates of the costs and increments uh, revenues, bonds to be issued, original uh, and estimated net tax capacities, and the expected duration of the district, the authority's alternate impact analysis on the net tax capacities of all other jurisdictions, descriptions of the studies and analyses used to make the but-for finding and identification of all parcels included in the district. And later when we get to the certification of districts, we'll talk more about pieces of the TIF plan that are of particular note to a county auditor. So then comes the opportunity for counties to comment on proposed TIF districts. Uh, why is this important? TIF districts, as we have seen, lock up new tax base and therefore um, TIF decisions impact all the local taxing jurisdictions, including the county. And yet the TIF authority controls all those decisions. So the comment period is the one chance for counties to potentially sway whether and how a TIF district will be used. Um, TIF is a tool. It is not inherently a good thing or a bad thing. It depends on how it's used relative to the but-for test. If it truly enables new development, redevelopment or affordable housing or jobs that otherwise wouldn't exist, then it's very positive and could be commended by the, welcomed by the county. If it's used in situations where it's not needed, it may be unnecessarily tying up county tax base um, and considered problematic or objectionable. So the law provides for this opp opportunity where after the TIF plan is drafted, and again, at least 30 days before the public hearing, the authority uh, must provide the county auditor and the school board clerk a copy of the proposed plan and 
the authority's estimate of fiscal and economic implications of the proposed district. So the fiscal and economic implications of the district include an estimate of the tax increment to be generated over the life of the district, along with shares attributable to county and school district levies, a uh, description of probable impact on city provided services, public infrastructure, and the ability to issue debt as affected by the issuance of any um, GO bonds, um, and any additional information that is requested by the county or the school district by written policy or otherwise um, regarding the size, timing, or type of development. The county auditor then must provide copies of this notice to the county board. Uh, we mentioned that a county can request additional information to be included in the fiscal and economic implications, and that this can be part of a written policy. The TIF Act allows the county to adopt such a policy with standard questions for any authority proposing to create a TIF district. Uh, if you do not have such a policy, you can still request additional information, uh, but you have to do so within 15 days after getting the TIF plan. So that uh, does not extend the 30-day period. So by the time you get the information back, you could have a uh, little time to react to it. In addition to the main county notice requirement, there is also an additional notice requirement uh, that has to also be given 30 days prior to the public hearing. Um, but this one only applies to proposed housing and redevelopment districts. The authority has to give a separate notice to the county commissioner or commissioners that represent the area in which the TIF district will be located. Uh, and that notice has to provide a general description of the boundaries and proposed activities and include an offer to meet to discuss the proposed district with the commissioner and generally solicit their comments. So it's admit, admittedly, it seems redundant, but there may have been a time when a commissioner didn't get a notice and this extra provision got added. Um, so I guess generally make sure you're getting uh, those communicated to your board members. Uh, if you are wondering about what types of comments and considerations counties might offer, here are a few examples. Uh, first, I think pol the policy comments and considerations um, a county might be able to just generally offer support or opposition to the proposed development. Obviously, that's the county's prerogative and there isn't much for us to add here, but um, second, a county could lend its own opinions on the merits of the but-for test, as this is kind of the only time that that test gets evaluated and it's critical to the wise use of TIF. So uh, we'll look up at that a little bit more here in a moment. Um, Third, even if TIF is merited, um, there are still size and scale issues that you could comment on, like um, whether they should specify a shorter duration or share some net tax capacity, and we'll also expand on that in a moment. But beyond policy considerations, there's also just practical considerations. As a county auditor or property tax administrator, there's an opportunity here to just look at the plan for clarity and ask for clarification as to whether there's an election to delay or if what their fiscal disparity election is, or the other various things that we're gonna talk about that you need to know when you're um, certifying a district. So there's a chance here to get clarification um, so they can fix it before they adopt it. Um, and specifically, um, there's a chance to um, look at the, the parcel list and the maps to make sure that they're not confusing and that you know what parcels they intend to put in the TIF district. Um, and then there's one very specific opportunity that you have um, uh, to identify whether the TIF district will impact county road improvements uh, and to get those county road improvement costs added to the TIF plan. We'll look at that closer here in a moment. So the, the specific requirement for the but-for test, I wanted to review that again um, as something you might comment on. A municipality must be able to find that, um, it really has two parts. So a municipality must find that in its opinion, the proposed development would not reasonably be expected to occur solely through the use of private investment within the reasonably foreseeable future. And then the second part, that the increased market value of the site that could reasonably be expected without the use of TIF would be less than the market value of the proposed uh, development after subtracting the present value of the projected increments. So in other words, what that's trying to say is the additional value created by the use of TIF has to exceed the value of the investment of the increment. So, but this finding is going to involve some subjectivity. The first part of the finding is unlikely to be very black and white, where you can conclude with certainty that no, no development would occur without TIF, 
or that the proposed development would surely occur without TIF. There's judgments that have to be made about would reasonably occur uh, absent the use of TIF and over a, a time horizon you know, of up to 26 years. So perhaps some modest or undesirable development uh, could occur late in the time horizon or maybe a uh, nearly identical uh, development would follow quite soon, but in between lies a lot of more nebulous possibilities. And to illustrate how important the but-for test is to the conceptual justification of TIF, we can look again at our model. Uh, in our ideal scenario, we had said that uh, the presumption was that um, uh, there would be blight and declining or, uh, or stagnating values absent the use of TIF. But if instead the proposed development would likely occur without the use of TIF, or it's going to occur without the use of TIF, then the conceptual justification disappears. And when the TIF district is created, it freezes the tax base, which results in the capture of the tax base for the duration of the district. And that represents an economic loss where tax base that could have been supporting local levies was instead captured to subsidize the development. And then there's gonna be no subsequent benefit because all that tax base would have existed anyway without the use of TIF. Um, again, it may not be so easy to assess what would or wouldn't happen with TIF, but this illustration sort of highlights the worst case scenario. Um, perhaps a more common possibility is where absent the use of TIF, a different development of lesser value would occur later in the TIF district's time frame. Uh, and in that scenario, the start of the district effectively leads to a higher value development and the capture of value and increment is generally neutral until the point at which the value that would have existed without TIF would begin to represent an offsetting economic loss because it would have been available without the, the use of TIF. So in the end, there's public benefit but it's offset to some degree by the, a little bit of that um, intervening economic loss. Um, so this kind of helps you see the importance of that but for finding. And the models here aren't um, accounting for immediate benefits like jobs and economic activity and that sort of thing, but they do help illustrate the effects taxpayers may experience and the importance of making a studious assessment of the but for test. Um, and so a county could comment on those kind of issues if they so chose if they chose to. Uh, but beyond the but-for test, um, we mentioned there might be size and scale issues. How much increment is needed to enable the development? Compare this to how much increment is generated over the life of the district. And is there a possibility that the cost would be too large or that um, early an early duration limit could be imposed or some tax capacity could be shared? Um, so for example, in our uh, going back to our example, we saw that there would be 83,200 of increment a year, which would yield uh, 2.1 million over its maximum duration. But what if the actual um, necessary costs to make the development happen only were only a million dollars? Then um, you know you could look to see as the authority added uh, other costs just to maximize the revenue stream or could they specify an earlier duration limit or at least give you some assurances that they do plan to decertify early um, or could they share that tax capacity and so that's the next concept for us to look at and explain here so the opportunity to share net tax capacity rather than retain the full captured net tax capacity is seldom used um, but for districts unlikely to need the full capture of increment for the full duration, it could be an attractive option. Sharing net tax capacity means making some of the initially captured value available to the tax base rather than retaining all of it for tax increments. Uh, this feature actually introduces some refined terminology for you to be aware of. Um, we talked about how the difference between the current and the original ca tax capacities is the amount of the captured net tax capacity. Well, uh, the authority could decide, for example, to share $20,000 in this example of captured value with the tax base. Then there would only be a retained captured net tax capacity of 44,000. And it's actually this retained captured net tax capacity that gets removed when you calculate tax rates um, uh, and serves as the, the value that generates the tax increments. So again, this option, um, to share value has been seldom used, like I think three times has it ever been used. Um, and the re this is probably because it may be more appealing to just capture the full increment at, um, and end the district as early as possible rather than risk some anticipated shortfall because you were sharing. And to illustrate that, um, 
how this how this works, we can look at our model again. The frozen tax base is essentially raised to include some of the captured tax capacity that's shared rather than retained, and it um, represents some immediate public benefit that'll be enjoyed for the duration of the district. But the risk is whether tax increments will be sufficient should the value growth end up being uh, less than what was projected, maybe because the scale of the development didn't quite work out or there were changes in market conditions or legislative changes. And so this risk is why most authorities, I think, instead of wanting to share value, uh, the more attractive option is just to decertify the district early once the costs have been paid. Um, and again, that's the kind of the whole goal of the six-year rule that we'll talk about um, a little later. So now, uh, a little more on that one practical option for counties to consider in the comment period. Counties can require certain county road costs to be included in the TIF plan and paid from tax increments. And to do that, the county must determine that the proposed development will substantially increase the use of county roads and require them to be improved, presenting additional costs. And that uh, said improvements and costs are not scheduled within five years under any current uh, county plans and would not be improvements that uh, would be expected to occur in the reasonably foreseeable future. So the county must exercise this option by notifying the authority and the municipality within 45 days, which by the way, could create a timing issue because they only had to give you a 30 day notice. And so if you wait the full 45 days, they may be already approved the plan. So um, this again is something that I kind of like to fix legislatively to, um, match these up, but um, there may be a low usage of this opportunity by counties. All right, so hopefully here you've seen there are opportunities for counties to use their comment opportunity, uh, and let's just finish up the approval process overview here a little bit. Note that a TIF plan must be approved by a municipality. Um, so if the TIF authority is like an HRA or an EDA or a Porter authority, uh, they must get their municipal approval as well, not just the authority approval. And uh, a plan has to be approved only after a public hearing and the public notice that we talked about. The published notice has to include a map of the district and the project area. And a county auditor can only certify a district um, uh, if it's approved by the municipality. So if it's not approved by a municipality, um, the county auditor cannot certify it. You should be aware that the TIF plans can be modified and amended by an authority at any time during the district's lifespan. Uh, some modifications require the county to perform administrative actions while others might not. For example, if parcels were being added or removed or the duration was changed or there was a change in an election to delay increment or which fiscal disparity option was selected, those are all uh, things that affect county administration. Alternatively, uh, if they are just amending some budget amounts and um, uh, then it may be something that um, doesn't really register on the county side of things. So also be aware that some modifications are gonna require a repeat of the full notice hearing and approval process for new districts, um, which would give you another opportunity to comment under new dynamics. Um, but the more administrative type changes do not require that full process. Um, the modifications that do require the full process include uh, enlargements of the geographic area of the district, which by the way is not allowed after the first five years, uh, reductions in the geographic area that still increase the captured value, and that would happen if um, the parcel they're removing had its current value is less than its original value, which is probably rare, um, an increase in bond in bonded indebtedness, a determination to capitalize interests, uh, an increase in the sh uh, share of debt tax capacity or what's being retained, an increase in the estimated costs to be paid with tax increments, so if they're increasing that whole budget, um, or uh, a designation of additional property acquisitions. Those are the things that uh, where you'll get another opportunity to comment. All right, well, let's proceed with the process for decertifying, or I'm sorry, certifying, we'll get to decertifying later, but for certifying TIF districts and creating, um, getting those all set up in your system. So the certification process is initiated by the authority uh, by making a request for certification. The county auditor uh, can specify the form and content of a request. Uh, and I believe one county at least has put together their own certification form. But I think for most counties and most TIF practitioners that are out there working with authorities, 
Uh, the requests have generally just been letters accompanied by the Department of Revenue's certification request supplement, which has been around forever, you know, back to the 80s or 70s. Um, Revenue has actually discontinued updating or providing that supplement, um, but I think its use is still kind of on autopilot. People are just doing it anyway. Um, the supplement simply uh, contains a few questions to, uh, that highlight key pieces of information so that the county doesn't necessarily have to dig through the uh, TIF plan to find everything. Um, the OSA uh, recently, we, we recently created an improved and uh, uh, sample request certification supplement and made it available. And I don't know if its use has caught on yet, but we felt like um, the certification request supplement was a valuable thing. So we wanted to kind of take over um, providing one um, and one that has, um, uh, you know, all of the relevant things that you might need to know. So to be clear, your county doesn't have to use this. Um, you can do your own thing, but uh, or if you wish, you can promote the use of this. Um, uh, so whatever kind of helps get the information to you so that you can certify a district. So let's go through this, um, our, our sample here so we can see the kinds of things to look for. Uh, at the top of the form, we just have a little county use only section um, for because it's important to note the certification request date and your actual certification date that you specify the original net tax capacity. Those two dates are very important to track. We'll explain that in a bit. Uh, the next a couple of sections collect information about the entities involved and the submitter's contact information. And then the, the district information section collects the district name, approval, uh, the municipal approval date, um, the plan type, um, and the type of district, you know, redevelopment housing or whatever. The uh, plan details section then collects the following information, all of which is very important when it's applicable, uh, even if some of it is seldom ever applicable. Um, they include whether there's an election to treat a parcel as being occupied by a demolished building. Um, that's one of those rare ones and the statutory citation is noted for it. Whether any special law applies to the district, that's less rare. Uh, what the authority anticipates will be the year for first receipt of increment, whether they've elected to delay the first receipt of increment as permitted by a statutory provision, whether they have specified a shorter duration limit uh, on their own, that's shorter than the statutory maximum, what they anticipate will be the year that decertification is required, whether they're sharing any net tax capacity, uh, and if you're uh, in one of the fiscal disparities regions, um, what election they made for the calculation of increment. Uh, and again, we'll expand on all of these here in a bit. Um, we also suggest that the certification contain some attachments the TIF plan obviously is going to be essential for you to receive as is a parcel list or map if there are any changes from what was identified in the plan. And there are frequently parcel changes that can occur during you know, a development process. So you're going to need to get accurate information and updated information uh, to allow you to certify the district because what existed at the time the plan was approved might not exist, might be different than what exists at the time they request certification. So the authority, um, we also think the authority should attach the resolution where the municipality approved the plan so that you know you're allowed to certify it. Um, and then there's a provision that also requires you to make value adjustments for properties that had building permits that were issued in the 18 months preceding the TIF plan approval. Um, so they should be supplying you a list of any of those uh, uh, permits and we'll be expanding on that here in a bit. Um, so once you receive a certification request, you'll formally certify the district by certifying the original net tax capacity. Um, and you'll also certify the original local tax rate, um, as we'll further discuss. Uh, a sample format for the certification is provided by the Department of Revenue in their Auditor and Treasurer Manual that's found on their website. So that kind of gives you a sample of, of how to format that. The certification of TIF district is, um, the cert is the certification of the original net tax capacity, which is the net tax capacity of all taxable real property in the district. The timing of the request for certification determines which year's value you use for the certification. And the cutoff uh, is for requests made by June 30th versus those that come after June 30th. So requests that are received by June 30th 
you use the previous assessment year for that original value, while those that come in after June 30th, you use the current assessment year. So for example, if a request is made on June 30th of this year, the previous assessment year is assessment 2020 for taxes payable in 2021. Um, if the request for uh, was made on July 1st of this year, then the current assessment year would be the assessment year 2021 value, um, which is the value used for taxes payable in 2022. Um, the county auditor then must certify the OMTC, the original net tax capacity, within 30 days after receipt of this request with the exception or allowance that it be done within 30 days of receipt of the request and sufficient information to identify the parcels. Obviously, that's something you need. Um, so if the, the, if the initial request left some confusion, you can um, wait and certify it after you get that clarity on, on the parcels. But do not wait until the original local tax rate is available if it isn't available yet. And um, because that delay can, can be problematic. So um you can just note on the certification that the original local tax rate is to be determined and um it's important to note that the tiff act defines a parcel as being a tract or plat uh, established prior to the certification as a single unit for purposes of assessment so you cannot include portions of parcels in tiff districts if if a part of a parcel is not in a district according to dor guidance it should be excluded. Um, and obviously you'd wanna communicate with them about that. It's it's possible, however, for a TIF plan to identify uh, parts of existing parcels at the time the TIF plan was approved to be in the district, as well, but they just need to then make sure that they're established as whole parcels prior to um, requesting certification. So no partial parcels in a TIF district, although you might see a partial part of a parcel described in a TIF plan and then see some parcel changes. The TIF Act in section 469.177 does identify some specific situations as to how the original net tax capacity should be identified. They include how to handle exempt property, um, redevelopment district parcels where that substandard building was recently demolished. That was the first item on the, the sample supplement. Uh, redevelopment districts that are established in qualified disaster areas or districts in presidential disaster areas. So there's a few um, special situations you can look up if they, uh, and they're in our county TIF guide on our website if um, you run into those. Uh, sometimes the original net tax capacity may also be specified in special legislation. So uh, be aware of that possibility. Uh, and for a hazardous substance subdistrict, which is separately certified from the overlapping parent district, the original net tax capacity is determined as the original net tax capacity of the parent district minus the costs to remediate the parcels. So that typically reduces the ONTC uh, to zero. We touched on certifying an original local tax rate. This is a separate requirement the statute provides uh, to be done when the ONTC is certified. Um, the original local tax rate is the sum of all the local tax rates that apply to parcels in the district, um, and it should be the rate for the payable year applicable to the, orig the original net tax capacity. Uh, unlike the original no net tax capacity, the original local tax rate will not change over the district's duration. Um, and once again, if the rate is not available within that 30 days, um, as is going to be the case for requests that come in after June 30th, you're not going to have your rate yet. Um, you should just certify the ONTC within the 30 days and then um, certify the original local tax rate later when it becomes available. Uh, and so the official certification date for a district is the date that the ONTC is certified, regardless of when the rate is. Um, as you certify districts, you should be aware of a prohibition or a limitation on the inclusion of uh, in a TIF district of certain parcels. A uh, county auditor cannot um, certify inclusion of parcels or parts of parcels if a larger parcel had been um, platted or subdivided that qualified in the last five years for green acres, open space, rural preserves, or agricultural preserves unless uh, they meet one of two situations, either 85% or more of the square footage of the planned buildings or facilities has to be for a qualified manufacturing facility or a qualified distribution facility, or the district has to be a housing district. So the idea is that 
the, these programs protect land against development. So you should not be able to go from protecting it against development to suddenly subsidizing the development so abruptly. Um, but the exceptions, I guess, are worthy, uh, worthy enough um, to permit that. Now, beyond just certifying the original net tax capacity and original local tax rate, when you certify a district, you're setting it up in your records and in your tax system. And there's a lot of important information to note, much of which we identified on that sample recommended supplement. And I want to review some of those to give further context. Um, the first is making sure to note or track important dates. The approval date um, is a, a benchmark date for the election uh, to delay first increment and for those prior planned improvements um, provisions that you need to be aware of. It also used to be uh, previously affected some duration limits, but it doesn't anymore. The certification request date triggers the June 30th cutoff that we discussed for certifying the value. And it's the most common date that gets referenced in effective dates uh, provisions for new laws. So, the, um, and it's also just the timing date for a few other provisions that we're not gonna go into detail on. But the point is, is that this, the actual request date is an important date that you need to record. And then the actual certification date when you set the original net tax capacity, that's similarly an important date that serves as the benchmark for a number of other provisions, like the four-year rule, um, the five-year rule, the six-year rule, and several other provisions. So those are separately important dates. Uh, and then the actual receipt of first increment date rather than just what they anticipated first receipt uh, would be, uh, determines the required decertification date under the statutory maximum duration limits. So recording when that first receipt of increment occurs is important. When you name the district in your county system, it's important to be cognizant of naming it in a way that enables good communication with, our, uh, with the authority, and with our office and with revenue. So counties, often assign a code um, that, and you might just name the district after the code, which might be good enough for your internal purposes and communicating internally, but that can cause communication headaches um, externally. So for example, if the city of Spruce created a TIF district called TIF 2-1 Acme Widgets, and your county assigned a code 1405 to that district in your system, then just naming it TIF uh, District 1405, or maybe, calling it Spruce District 5 because it happened to be the fifth district the city requested, um, you're not going to, that's not gonna allow clear communication when talking externally. It's better to incorporate the elements of the city's name. So, you know, 1405 TIF 2-1 would be better or just adopting the authority's name and uh, adding your code is probably the best. The Department of Revenue uses three TIF codes as part of county reporting. And we also piggyback on them rather than create something new um, to track data in our system. So the location code is one of the codes, is the code that's assigned by the Department of Revenue. And you can look it up in their code tables on their PRISM reporting web pages. So for example, uh, 726 is the code for the city of Bloomington. But if a city has an HRA or an EDA, there might be a separate code. So for example, the Bloomington HRA code is 728, um, but please make sure you assign the correct TIF location code. Uh, and if you have a new authority that doesn't have a code yet, you might have to ask revenue to assign a code. The TIF district code is a three digit code that the county auditor uh, assigns to identify the district. Uh, when combined with the location code, it must be unique to a single district. Whether, when, whether that be an active district or decertified districts. Some counties keep this code unique regardless of the location code, which isn't a bad idea. Um, but do not assign this code hastily and keep track of what you've used because when the same code gets reused, our databases get all fouled up because two districts, you know, um, we can't assign two districts information to one code. So, um, it, and it can be very troublesome to have to fix it, e even on your side, you don't wanna be messing up your systems ca computations and changing codes. So um, please be careful when assigning the, the district code. The hazardous substance subdistrict code is generally 01 for the hazardous substance subdistrict and 00 for all other districts. Uh, using something else or changing it from one year to the next is generally not desirable. Um, a TIF authority may elect 
to delay the first receipt of increment by up to four years by specifying the first receipt year in the TIF plan. Um, but this is not allowed for economic development districts, however. Um, the election is meant to avoid an, a minimal first year of increment from starting the duration clock. So let's look at an example here where a plan was approved June 2nd of this year and the request for certification was made before July 1st and construction is slated to begin this fall and finish next summer. We can actually see two possibilities for less than full increments. Uh, pay 2021 based on the January 2nd, 2020 assessment date would be the base year. So if the January 2nd, 2021 value had already increased due to just market conditions, then pay 2022 increment would result. Um, and with only partial construction likely to be included in the January 2nd, 2022 assessment date for payable 23, um, payable 23 might reflect only partial increments. And it's probably not until pay 2024 where you would likely see the first full year of increment. So an authority could elect to just set 2024 as the first, uh, the year for first receipt of increment, and that would skip collections in 2022 and 2023. And then the maximum duration limit for the district would be 2020 or 2049 instead of 2047. So, um, so yeah, those are so that's their opportunity to elect to delay. Um, and sometimes they could they could have skipped the 2022 increment here by just waiting till after June 30th to request certification, but um, they do have this formal election option. So a couple of notes are important regarding elections to delay. First, do not rely on what they state on the certification supplement or on any form that they provide you. Make sure to check the TIF plan. Um, at least one time I uh, compared TIF plans to the forms that they send us when we ask them uh, to submit us TIF plans. And the forms were incorrect about having an election to delay about half the time. Um, I think sometimes it's clear in the plan, but they might not think it's a real delay. So they debate whether to answer that it's a delay. But um, TIF plans can be confusing as to whether they're making a clear election to delay versus just speculating that there might be a delay in the first receipt. So the election needs to be clearly stated in the plan. And let's look at some examples of what we've seen. So in this first one, the city elects pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 469-175, subdivision 1B, to, serve, to receive first distribution of increment in 2023. That quite clearly is an election to delay. Uh, this next example, the city expects to receive first increment in 2023 and elects to have uh, first collection B, year B 2023. Um, here they're not citing the statute, but I think it's pr a pretty clear election. Um, even if it isn't an effective t delay, you know they they expect it in 2023, so they're setting to, they're electing 2023. You know they might not label this on the on your collection form as being an election to delay because they think it's not a delay. But had there been some uh, surprising 2022 increment, you would need to enforce this delay and not give them their 2022 increment. So that one seems to be an election. Uh, and as this last example, the city will receive increment beginning in 2023. To me, that, that just appears to be an expectation or a presumption, doesn't amount to an election. They'd be pretty hard pressed to say, hey, you know, you didn't, you didn't uh, apply our election to delay um, just based on saying something like this. So um, I noted earlier that the actual first receipt date and not the anticipated first receipt date is what drives the duration limits. But I think that point warrants some emphasis. At one time, I compared actual first receipt dates to the anticipated first receipt dates that they mentioned in TIF plans. And I found that about 25% of the time, the TIF plan was not correct. So therefore, the anticipated um, required decertification date that they mentioned in TIF plans may also very well be incorrect. Uh, and the county is responsible for enforcing maximum durations and not distributing increment after they've been reached. So tracking a required um, decertification date is, um, is really important or refer to that as the RDD. Um, also be aware that special laws might specify something different or the authority may have specified the shorter duration in the TIF plan. Um, 
So make sure to verify and revisit required decertification dates once actual first receipt of increment occurs. Don't just rely on what they anticipated in the plan. Uh, sometimes it occurs earlier than they anticipated. Sometimes development delays mean it gets, uh, it occurs later than they anticipated. So it can go either way. Uh, another important factor to identify when setting up a TIF district in your tax system is the fiscal disparity election. If you're uh, located in a fiscal disparity area, the municipality must elect the method of tax increment computation. So in short, the fiscal disparities program requires a portion of new commercial industrial value uh, to be shared uh, with, a, with the broader area. But this conflicts with TIF districts wanting to capture that same value. You can't share it and capture it. Um, so to solve this, two choices exist for tax computation. With option A, which is the default, um, the TIF district captures the new value and receives the full increment, and then the fiscal disparities contribution has to come from the existing tax base, which causes taxpayers to shoulder extra burden. Um, but with option B, the fiscal disparity contribution can be made from the district, holding taxpayers harmless, but then that really reduces the capture of increment. Um, and lastly, for this section, you need to be aware that the prior, of the prior planned improvements provision, it's a tongue twister, uh, the county auditor must increase the original net tax capacity to include the net tax capacity of any improvements that were approved by building permits issued in the 18 months prior to the TIF district's approval. Um, the, uh, so you may have to work with the assessors on that. The idea here is to ensure that the TIF district doesn't capture uh, value growth that was already planned without the need for TIF assistance. Um, and so the authority has to provide you with a list of building permits issued when they make their request for certification. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, we are delighted to have our state auditor here, Julie Blaha, and she wanted to say a few words. Julie, I'm going to launch your camera and you are unmuted, so welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Ailey. Uh, and thank you all so much for uh, participating in this training. Uh, now, I know you're getting a lot of facts, a lot of details, and uh, I know that Jason and, um, and, and Lisa and Haley, they all have that covered. And in fact, this is just always another good opportunity to uh, say to other people how proud I am of the Tax Room and Finance Division. Uh, I think they just do great work on a, what is a really difficult subject for a lot of people. Uh, but I'm particularly happy to uh, welcome you all back from the break and say a special thank you for all you've done. You know, over this last year, uh, two years, I should say, uh, you all have gotten your counties uh, and a couple of your cities, I think, a couple city people on here too, through COVID. And you did it not only under um, some some potentially confusing situations. Uh, you had to do it from your from your kitchen table with kids yelling in the background. <laughs> That's really impressive. So first off, thank you for all you've done and you're still doing as we continue to uh, recover uh, from COVID. And I also wanna thank you for particularly working on TIF. You know, our office really focuses on the idea that we protect local solutions that make our communities work. And TIF is a great example of that. It's one of those solutions that we're using to do things that we didn't know how, how to do otherwise. Um, whether that is to encourage growth in your community, um, uh, improve housing, there's so many things people are doing uh, with tax increment finance. And so I wanna thank you because this is the kind of stuff that brings people together, that makes your community strong. I know you probably didn't expect in a TIF training for someone to come up and thank you for saving the world. But honestly, this is what saving the world looks like. I don't, it's tempting to think it's looking like a, a Netflix special with great effects and, and, and swelling music. No, it looks like filling out your paperwork. It were, looks like trying to, trying to find a way to get the funds to the place you need it the most. This is what changing the world looks like. So um, though you might not get your own Netflix special, you deserve one. Uh, and I personally wanna make sure that you know that we know the incredible, incredible contribution you're making. And in a time right now where unity is hard to come by, when we sometimes feel divided, uh, where things are pretty intense, the work you do to just get things done, to do them right, and to do them in a way that actually helps a real person on a real day, 
can't be underestimated. Your work is amazing, and I thank you so much for it. Uh, and with that, far be it for me to get in the way of one more minute of fascinating TIF information. <laughs> so again, thank you. We're so happy to work with you, and we're proud to support all the great work you're doing in your communities. So thank you on behalf of the whole uh, Office of the State Auditor. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the pros. So I'm not sure if it's uh, Jason or Haley or Lisa that takes over now, but enjoy the rest of your day. Can't wait to see you all in person. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Have, have a good day. Thanks for stopping in. Bet. All right, um, uh, let's check in. Haley, did we have any questions on the last section or so? Uh, yeah, we have one. Uh, if I find out or have been notified that there's a problem with a DOR code, what do I need to do to fix that? Okay, yeah, uh, the best thing to do is to just email us or, um, and we may, I don't know if we'll have to sort it out with revenue too or not, but, um, and sometimes we reach out to you when we see a code being reused or something like that. So yeah, I think just email us and, um, um, and we'll just kind of figure it out kind of depending on the circumstances all right, well, let's move on then to discuss TIF district decertification. So by statutory definition to decertify or decertification means the termination of a TIF district, which occurs when the county auditor removes all remaining parcels from a district. Doing so ends the collection of tax increments um, or turns off the spigot, so to speak. Uh, however, even after a TIF district decertifies, its reporting must continue to us until all remaining TIF revenues have been spent or returned to the county auditor. So um, a large number of districts that are, report each year are decertified districts, like a good couple hundred or more. So um, things aren't really done uh, until the books are closed, so to speak. So you may still have experience with this districts after they are decertified. Statute provides that the county auditor must decertify a TIF district upon the earliest of the maximum statutory duration limit, reaching a earlier duration limit if one is specified in the TIF plan, completion of the actions required under the six-year rule, or receipt of a re written request by the authority to decertify the district. Um, decertification is often specified as being December 31st, as we'll discuss in a moment. Um, note that a county uh, may not likely be aware of six-year rule activities. So practice has been that authorities notify the counties that decertification is required under that provision. But there is a bit of statutory language that seems to assume that counties are gonna know. Um, and we're looking, you know, that you just be monitoring it and, and responsible. For, um, and we're looking possibly for some uh, so we're, we may suggest some legislative clarifications to that statute. Uh, and that's just another little example of where having some county representation in a working group to chat about um, proposed TIF laws uh, here and there would be very valuable. So let's take a look, a closer look at the six year rule, um, which follows from the five year rule. Um, in my brief history rundown, I mentioned how uh, a big concern in the early years was that districts would take advantage of pooling and TIF plan modifications to find new things to spend money on and stay open as long as possible, rather than just being limited to the initially proposed development. Uh, to tighten things up, the five-year rule provision was created to add a timing element to what are considered in-district or out-district expenditures. So increment is only considered to be spent on activities in the district when they're spent within the first five years or they're used that finance costs that were incurred in the first five years, um, or if they're spent for housing purposes. Um, so therefore, uh, new uses uh, after the first five years are considered out-district pooling expenditures, even if they're physically located in the district. So that forces any additional uses of tax increment beyond the originally planned activities to have to fit within pooling limits which keeps them a bit more in check than before. Um, the six-year rule itself has two parts. Um, it provides that starting in the sixth year, the in-district percentage of increments, so the, you can pull if you can pull 20%, the in-district percent is 80%. The in-district percentage of increments collected each year must be used only for in-district purposes 
and not for pooling, even if it might fit within the overall pooling limit, which is measured over the life of the district. So um, that's the first part. The second, and maybe more importantly, is uh, the six-year rule requires that early decertification occur when outstanding bonds have been defeased and sufficient money has been set aside to pay uh, remaining in district obligations. So in other words, a district may not be able to stay open and continue to collect increments solely to fund out district or new activities. And again, uh, these limits serve to make the captured tax base available as soon as possible and restrict increment revenues from being used to cover new costs. Uh, note there's been some legislative proposals recently to eliminate the part of the six-year rule that requires the extra annual restrictions on pooling. So, um, so that the six-year rule would just become the decertification requirement. We've been looking at possible language changes with interested stakeholders. So again, it'd uh, be nice to have a county voice in those conversations. When it comes to the statutory maximum duration limits, you must monitor and apply, and we've talked about this before. Be sure to distinguish the actual limit from the anticipated required decertification date that was noted when the TIF district was created. The actual limit must be based on when first receipt of an increment actually occurred. Also, increments from taxes payable in the year in which the TIF district uh, terminates due to hitting its statutory maximum duration limit do get paid to the authority. And this is why December 31st is often expressed as the decertification date. Um, although the, uh, the official certification date might be a mid-year date, they get the whole year increment is still distributed to them. And that would include any uh, subsequent January settlement. Um, and the other footnote here is that in the past, some districts had duration limits that were based on approval dates instead of the first receipt of increment. So you might, so for those of you who've been around a while, you might re recollect something different than this. Um, or that this wasn't always the case, but um, now they're all uh, based off of first receipt of increment. Uh, when a district is decertified early, it's customarily done via a resolution. When a district decertifies, we require the completion of a confirmation of decertified TIF district form. And the purpose of this form is to ensure that the authority, the county, and the OSA are all on the same page. The authority fills out part A of the form, with a decertification date, final distribution amount, uh, and amounts that um, the authority is ready to return. The county completes part B to confirm that that information is correct or to note any discrepancies. Uh, and then the authority must ensure that a fully completed form is sent to us. But we really do appreciate it when you copy us, when you return the form to the authority. Um, for Decertification for early decertifications, we also ask the authority to provide us a copy of the resolution that they use to decertify the district. Um, this is currently, unfortunately, a paper based kind of scan and email process. We have been planning to streamline it and we will switch to a more efficient electronic process. Uh, there's always more IT demand than capacity, it seems. So, hopefully, though, this will be coming early next year. Uh, one provision to note here relates to delinquent property taxes received after decertification. The county auditor may only distribute such delinquent taxes as tax increments if the parcel was in the TIF district when it was certified and the taxes were delinquent and not just past due. Uh, their non-payment had caused obligations to which tax increment had been pledged to either go unpaid or to have to be paid from other sources and the authority provided the county auditor with the information needed to administer such payments. So otherwise, and generally speaking, delinquent receipts are not distributed uh, that to as tax increment. They're just distributed as ordinary property taxes. Um, but uh, in this one exception, um, they can get those distributions. All right, well, let's now discuss things that counties must either perform or monitor on an annual basis. So uh, we acknowledged earlier that the original net tax capacity is essentially frozen because there's numerous situations where a county auditor may have to make adjustments from year to year to the original net tax capacity of a district. So let's identify those potential adjustments now. Uh, county auditor should make ONTC adjustments um, when there are changes in the classification of the parcels in the district. When legislative change, when the legislature changes class rates that impact any TIF parcels, 
when TIF parcels change from exempt to taxable or taxable to exempt, when districts are enlarged or reduced in size, when TIF parcels cease to qualify for green acres, open space, egg preserves, or rural preserves, um, if they're allowed to be in, and when TIF parcels have value increases under plat law, when TIF parcels cease uh, or begin to qualify for any exclusions, when a disaster de declaration impacts TIF parcels, and when TIF parcels are affected by a court order debatement, stipulation agreement, voluntary abatement, or a commissioner of revenue order. So um, the TIF Act does provide how the ONTC should be adjusted in each of these cases, and you can find um, the references uh, and more detail on how to make these adjustments in the TIF County Guide. So on our website, we do have uh, the TIF County Guide, um, and you can um, go to that for all of the details. But clearly, there's a good list here of things that um, you, should, you should perhaps look for and identify each year so that you don't miss any of them and you can make the appropriate adjustments. Um, you know, you may have years where you don't have to make any changes, but it's good to look each year. Uh, note that uh, many of the ONTC adjustments must explicitly be certified to the authority, and more generally, there's a provision requiring county auditors to annually certify to each authority the captured net tax capacity of each district and its proportion to the district's total net tax capacity. Um, in this certification, you would also identify any shared net tax capacity if that happens. Um, moving from values to tax increments, the county auditors must annually calculate tax increment. Uh, this is largely the tax on the retained captured value for those of you who are not in fiscal disparities. For those that are in the fiscal disparities areas, we've previously noted the two options that are repeated here. Um, option B was required for economic development districts with a certification request date prior to June 30th of 2014, but newer economic development districts can choose option A. The method of computation remains the same for the life of the district, um, except that the election can be changed once from option A to option B. And under some rare special deficit uh, conditions, the option can be changed from B to A. Um, the option A versus B choice is going to primarily impact what you identify as being the current net tax capacity. And it'll also impact the tax rate because the captured tax base is greater um, and the fiscal disparity contribution has to be made from the existing tax base. So um, it's gonna be easiest to just look at an example or at least a simplified example here. And uh, you should rely on the Department of Revenue for any more specific or detailed property tax calculation instructions. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully this is consistent with the, with those. If our uh, net tax capacity for a single TIF parcel is currently $60,000 and the ONTC has, was, had been identified as $10,000, you have a growth in value of $50,000. Uh, and in this example, we'll assume that it's all commercial industrial value. And under fiscal disparities, let's say 40% of the CI growth um, or $20,000 has to be contributed to the fiscal disparities pool. So under option A, um, where the TIF district makes the full capture and the fiscal disparity contribution is made from outside the district, we would determine that the current $60,000 of net tax capacity is the current net tax capacity. Um, this exceeds the original NTC and gives us $50,000 of captured NTC. And we're gonna ignore um, we're gonna ignore shared, the possibility of shared value here. Uh, under this scenario, let's say the tax rate calculates to 116.688%. And we're gonna omit all the details of the tax rate calculation, but note that this is gonna be higher than the option B example, because the rest of the tax base had to be, uh, had to make the fiscal disparity contribution, and we are having higher captured value in this example. So the rate is gonna be slightly higher than the B example. Um, applying this rate to the captured net tax capacity gives us 58,344 of tax increments. Under option B, we would make the $20,000 fiscal disparity contribution from the current value in the district and determine that the remaining current net tax capacity is 40,000. So, you know, the, the option is affecting what we identify as the current NTC. 
So now the captured net tax capacity is smaller at 30,000. And again, the rate will be slightly lower because the remaining tax base um, that is used in the rate calculation didn't make the FD contribution. So in this example, tax increments are 34,864. And this example shows how option A provides the full capture uh, while raising rates um, in comparison to option B, um, which can significantly impact the amount of increment captured. When option A does apply, um, the increased property tax imposed on other properties as a result of the contribution to fiscal disparities coming from outside the district has to be included on their annual disclosures, the authorities' annual disclosure statements that they have to publish each year. Um, and I imagine that TIF authorities are probably going to turn to county folks for some assistance in identifying the data that they need to make the calculations. The instructions for those option A tax increase calculations are provided by the Department of Revenue on its website so you can see what data is needed or refer authorities there. Um, I did recently note that one county put these calculations on their website, so um, kudos to them. Uh, now, beyond fiscal disparities, there's also there's another calculation provision for everyone to understand, and that's that tax increment might be limited to less than the full tax on the retained net tax capacity. Um, the tax increment is limited to the tax generated by the lesser of the original the local tax tax rates or the original local tax rate, and this is why um, you had to certify an original local tax rate at the beginning of the district. If the original local tax rate is the lesser rate, then tax increments get limited um, and the extra taxes um, are called excess taxes. Now, please note that excess taxes, which are not tax increments, should not be confused with the unfortunately similarly named excess tax increments which are tax increments that are received in excess of what a plan authorizes. So you got two, two concepts labeled excess, but they're two different things here. So excess taxes are the additional taxes generated on the retained captured net tax capacity when the current rate is higher than the original rate. Um, this provision was uh, enacted by the legislature because they didn't want TIF districts to benefit from increasing tax rates. They only wanted um, increment to be generated by increasing value. Um, the county auditor therefore has to determine uh, and distribute excess taxes appropriately um, as part of the TIF computation process. So here's a graphic maybe that helps uh, illustrate what excess taxes are. On the x-axis, we got the value and on the y, we have the rate. Um, so the blue area is the taxes on the original net tax capacity. So no matter what the rate is, all of the taxes on, um, on the original value are the regular property taxes that get distributed to taxing jurisdictions. Um, as the uh, value increases and you start to get captured net tax capacity, the taxes on captured net tax capacity up to the original local tax rate are going to be tax increments. And it's if, if the rate exceeds that original value, then those additional taxes on the captured um, the tax capacity are just excess taxes. They're not tax increments. They're essentially bonus revenue that just gets distributed to the county, the city, and the school district um, in a special manner. So they're not part of levies. They're not tax increments. They're something else. Um, excess taxes are distributed to the municipality, county, and school district based on whose current local tax rate produced the excess. Um, the other taxing jurisdictions, like special districts, do not receive any excess taxes. Um, and each of the three entities' shares of excess taxes are determined by basically dividing their rate increase by the sum of the rate increases for those three entities. If the excess taxes are caused entirely by special taxing jurisdiction rates, then the excess taxes are just distributed to the municipality, county, and school district in proportion to their tax rates. Uh, and an example I think will help make sense of this again. So, and by the way, this is based on our interpretation of what DOR has instructed. Uh, so please rely on their guidance if there happens to be any difference or change from what you see here. The first part is determining the total amount of excess taxes. So here we're showing the current and the original tax rates in total and for each of the jurisdictions. Um, and we show any tax rate increases so for, simple, for simplicity, I'm ignoring all the decimal places, but I know that 
those decimal places are critically important. Um, but the current rate is 125% um, versus an original rate of 100%, so that's an increase of 25 percentage points. The county rate had increased seven percentage points. The city rate had increased 15 percentage points. The school district increase was zero because it actually went down. Um, and then other special districts had increased six percentage points. So the, if the retained captured net tax capacity is $10,000, then uh, because the original rate is the lesser rate compared to the current rate, then tax increment is gonna be limited to the original rate multiplied by that captured value. So tax increments are limited to $10,000, but the full rate is applied to the value. So there's actually $12,500 of taxes on retained captured value, but when you subtract the 10,000 of tax increments, you get the $2,500 of excess taxes. So now how does this get dis distributed? That's the second part is how do you distribute this? So determine the county, city, and school district um, shares by dividing each entity's increase by the sum of those three increases. So note that the 7, 15, and 0% increases totals 22, not the full 25, um, because we're ignoring special districts. So these fractions or shares then get applied to the $2,500 of excess taxes to determine the distributions. So note again that this method uh, of distribution is only used for excess taxes. So when you when you have to redistribute excess tax increments or other returns of tax increments, that's a different process. That's not this process. This is just the process for the excess taxes. So now let's switch over to excess tax increments. Excess tax increments are those that exceed the amount needed to pay authorized costs in uh, the TIF plan for that year. And authorities are gonna determine this amount annually and they do so using our annual TIF reporting form. Authorities are required to use excess tax increments to either prepay debt or they have to return it to the county auditor by September 30th of the following year. Um, and when these return tax increments are received, the county auditor is going to distribute them uh, to the city, the county, and the school district in proportion to their tax rates. So there's no fancy calculation like for excess taxes. It's just the entity's rate is a share of the total rate for those three entities. Um, note that whenever you send uh, a distribution to uh, a school district of tax increment, um, there is a requirement to notify the Commissioner of Education of those distributions within 30 days. Uh, you may receive returns of other tax increment besides what is formally calculated as excess tax increments. If they have unneeded surplus amounts that uh, even though they fit within what the TIF plan authorized, um, they can still return that for redistribution in the same manner. Uh, and yeah, so you just, whether it's surplus increment or excess tax increment, you distribute it in the same manner. So that distinction may not be meaningful to you. Um, you may also receive payments or returns of increments that were made to remedy um, increments that were either received or spent in violation of the TIF Act. And um, those also get redistributed as, tax, as excess tax increments with one exception. Um, statute provides a process surrounding formal notices of noncompliance where a, an authority has 60, uh, 60 day response period. And if the authority doesn't make a payment within that period uh, or before a county attorney has to commence action to compel the payment, then they would not receive their share of any subsequent uh, remedy distributions. So the statute does require us to forward any unresolved uh, issues to county attorneys to pursue. And if it's not pursued within a year, then it gets referred again to the county or to the attorney general. And it's been uh, several years since a formal notice had to be, uh, what since one that was not remedied within the 60 day period, and, and since we've had to um, send one to an, a county attorney. But in those cases where you'd have to um, not return a share to the authority, we would likely be in communication about that. So. Okay. Um, Another calculation and distribution item to be aware of is the OSA's enforcement deduction. The um, county treasurer must deduct 0.36% from all distributions of tax increments 
which then um, will be sent to fund our office's TIF oversight functions. Uh, note, do not deduct this amount from redistributions of returned increments because once they're returned and get redistributed, they're not increment anymore at that point. So you will need to report the amount of these enforcement deductions on our county TIF information form, and then you remit the amounts actually to the Minnesota Management and Budget. And these are to be included with the mo monthly remittances for vital statistics and real estate surcharges and fees. Um, make sure that you send them with this MMB form. Um, we've had difficult time getting them properly identified and sent to our office if they're misdirected elsewhere or are not uh, accompanied by this form. So um, there is a copy of this form in the handouts. Okay, so let's um, continue with other annual responsibilities. And the first one we've already covered is identifying and enforcing duration limits to make sure that no increment is paid after a duration limit is reached. Um, any tax increment that is payable in the year in which the district re reaches its maximum statutory duration is paid to the authority, inc including January settlements. Uh, and as discussed before, the limits extend from first receipt of increment based on the um, type of district. There are several items to note relative to duration limits. Special law may provide the dura uh, different duration limit, so check for that. Hazardous substance subdistricts can extend beyond the overlying district's uh, duration limit. Um, a sub subdistrict can go 25 years longer or the time needed to, um, to uh, recoup the costs. Um, an authority cannot waive or decline first receipt of increment in an attempt to start to delay the start. That's what the election to delay option is for. So they can't just say, we don't want the, the small increment. They would have to make an, a formal election. Um, modifications do not extend duration limits. And our county TIF guide has information about these last two items on here. Um, they're rarely, if ever, used situations. I, I'm not familiar that either has ever been used but they exist in statute, so we just threw them in here. Uh, but if you run into situations, there are there's some potential to extend a duration to recover cleanup costs. And if there's an interest rate reduction program, there's a 15 year limit. So look those up if um, you ever come across them. Uh, another time-based provision in the TIF Act is the county auditors responsible for the four year knockdown rule. So if no activity commences on a parcel in accordance with the TIF plan after four years from the date of certification of the original value, then the parcel must be knocked down such that it will no longer capture value or produce increment. And activity in this context means things like demolition, rehab, renovation, and site preparation. Um, it includes qualified adjacent street improvements like new relocated or rebuilt streets, but not just routine overlays or maintenance. Um, uh, and it in, um, installing utility services like sewer and water does not count as activity in this context. So to apply this, the statute requires authorities to provide evidence or documentation to the county by February 1st of the fifth year following certification. Uh, and of course, compliance with that uh, it kind of expects a lot for the authority to be tracking. So counties are probably well advised to track this and seek the information when it's timely. Um, you know, and maybe annually review whether any of your districts are about to hit this time limit is maybe a good idea. And then um, you should compare any documentation that they provide uh, to the TIF plan to ensure its consistency. And if no um, authorized activity takes place, uh, the statute indicates that the ONTC of the parcels has to be excluded from the district's ONTC. And that's a, honestly a bit cryptic, and I'm not exactly positive how you operationalize that, but I think um, you may be tempted to think of it as just removing the parcel from the district, even if technically, strictly, it hasn't been removed, it's just been knocked down. But I think for um, possibly for administration purposes, um, you're kind of taking it out of the district. Um, not knowing your systems, I can't give you more, so I'd love to give you the specific directions, but um, people have different systems. So uh, if development activity subsequently commences on a parcel, it can be restored to the district. So it wasn't fully 
completely removed forever um, and it can produce increment again but at that point its original value gets reset to the most recent value not the original value from back when certification was requested another good annual check or review is to look for any special laws that may affect districts in your county uh, another batch was passed this year. Um, special legislation could require action by the county auditor, uh, things like adjusting a duration limit or an ONTC. Um, so for uh, 2019, authorities reported 116 TIF districts had special laws out of about 1,650 districts. So it's not all that rare or unusual. Uh, and some special laws may require uh, approval by the affected local units of government. So you may even have a chance as the county to approve or refuse to approve um, some special laws. The, the most common special law provisions include five-year rule extensions, duration extensions, uh, changes to the rules for creating a district, and changes to various limits on the use of increment. Another potential responsibility uh, is to respond to a notice to withhold tax increment for, from our office. Um, authorities must submit annual reporting to our office by August 1st of each year. And if we haven't received a report by October 1st, we notify the county auditor to withhold distribution of tax increments. And you would withhold 100% of all subsequent increment until we uh, notify you otherwise. So when we do eventually get the reporting, we have five working days to mail you a notice to go ahead and release the increment, and you would have to distribute it within 15 working days. Um, I guess the good news here is that um, the county gets to keep any interest accrued. Um, there's been a couple that have been withheld for um, a longer period of time, but usually it's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, hopefully this next one isn't an annual responsibility. But if a county auditor makes an error or a mistake, um, there is a statute to address this, and it provides uh, some these broad options for resolving the issue. You can uh, certify an ONTC at the appropriate value for uh, for a later year and extend the, dur the duration of the district. You can recertify affected parcels and extend durations. You can recertify or correct original local tax rates. You can adjust tax rates for one or more years to recoup um, amounts you advance to, to replace reduced increments, or you can take um, other appropriate action, uh, so increment compensates for or offsets the error and correctly reflects the application of the law. So that last option there is a very broad catch-all possibility. The errors or mistakes that we're talking about here are errors made by the county and include substantive matters like decertifying a district incorrectly, failing to certify a district, incorrectly certifying it, or otherwise failing to compute uh, the correct amount of tax increment. So this isn't minor mistakes like noting a wrong date if that doesn't have any further consequences. Um, there is some process provided. The county auditor must notify the authority or municipality in writing of its proposed solution 30 days before taking the corrective action. Now, naturally, there's probably going to be some back and forth communication with the authority and the between the authority and the county when there's an error, um, which is great. But um, and sometimes, you know, there's agreement. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to fix it. Okay. But I think it's it's good to make sure you provide a formal notice because we've run into situations where the city's, the authority or municipality has come back and said, hey, they don't agree anymore. Um, and it's there's a question as to whether there was uh, a notice uh, or not. And um, if you cannot agree, the matter gets um, submitted to the Department of Revenue for resolution and they consult with us um, in considering the correct resolution. Um, and so whenever there's a correction of error, whether it needs um, DOR's involvement or not, um, the county auditor should notify both revenue and our office of corrections that you're making. You can just send us an email. Um, lastly, county uh, counties are required uh, may require reimbursement from authorities for your actual um, expenses for administering administering TIF districts. If your county chooses to do this, the county auditor must provide documentation of the cost annually and the county may require payment by February 15th of the following year. 
if uh, the costs become disputed and the county and authority or municipality cannot agree on the amount to be reimbursed, then it, either party can submit it for demanding or for binding arbitration. And that brings us to the end of the annual responsibilities section. Um, do we have any questions that have come up um, related to this? Yeah. What sort of evidence or documentation is uh, sufficient to document the four-year rule? Hmm. Um, let's see. I don't. I don't know that there's any. There's no provisions that says what is sufficient. So I think it. It really is a matter of what is the county auditor can um, believe is sufficient information. I think anything that distributes that there actually there's actually been development activity. Um, I, th I think you've got some flexibility as to what, you know, you just need to be assured that development activity has actually happened or it hasn't happened. Um, and uh, so I think, so I guess the answer is whatever's sufficient uh, to the county auditor uh, to make the determination that they need to make. Um, there's nothing, um, I don't have examples to share because um, we generally don't see that. So, very good. All right, well now let's take a look at um, county reporting requirements for all related to TIF. Um, broadly, there's just a few TIF reports for counties. For the OSA, there's the annual county uh, TIF information form, and then those confirmation of decertified TIF district forms that we already covered. Uh, for the Department of Revenue, there was the old TIF supplement, uh, and that data is still being reported as a component of PRISM reporting. And for the MMB, um, there is the previously noted remittance reports that are used when sending in the enforcement deduction amounts to them. So let's take a bit of a closer look at the county TIF information form reporting. It's due at the end of March for uh, reporting data related to the prior year. And it communicates several key activities to aid our, over, our TIF oversight, uh, which then in turn um, serves county interests as well as taxpayer interests in general. Um, it allows us to verify that the TIF authority is reporting accurately, and it communicates to us how much TIF enforcement deduction transfers we should be getting from, from MMB. Uh, the form itself is an Excel file that has four tabs. And there are uh, instructions on our website. We try to highlight any changes on the first page, um, if there are any, but um, rem remember those instructions are available if you need them. Uh, the first tab is the home tab, and you don't have to make any entries on this tab. Uh, it just contains general information about the form, like the due date and the purpose and links to instructions and resources. Uh, but it also contains uh, uh, an important red messages table that identifies if there's any unresolved red messages on the other tabs. And a red message will appear when an entry or an answer has not yet been entered or when um, it contains something incorrect. So for example here, the first question on the TIF activity tab requires a yes or no answer that had been overlooked. Um, so the table's showing there's still a red message for that tab. Um, sometimes when you're on those other tabs, you have to scroll way to the right to see the red messages. So sometimes those can get overlooked. So it's a good a good idea to check this table quick before you try submitting a form because it'll let you know if, if it'll submit or not. Because um, a file cannot submit properly if it still has a red message. Um, the second tab is the TIF activity tab. And on this tab, there's a few questions about whether certain activities occurred during the year. Uh, for each of these, you just answer yes or no, and then provide any basic details when there is activity. Uh, and these activities include uh, new district certifications, districts getting their first receipt of tax increment, increment being returned to the county for redistrib redistribution, decertifications of any districts, the enforcement of the four-year rule for any districts, and any corrections of errors. And then there's also just kind of a survey question as to whether the county is charging for admin costs. Um, and just for your information, 33 counties reported um, this past, this year, that they are charging for admin costs. So I guess the other um, uh, 54 are not, but um, uh, just so you know. 
Um, the next tab is for reporting the distributions and settlements of tax increments to each TIF district. The distribution amounts are reported for the payable year. You exclude the January settlement for that calendar year and report that payable year's January settlement, if any, in a separate column. Uh, because this might be a lot of data entry for a few counties that have you know, hundreds of districts, we offer the option to report the data in a comma-separated value file format instead of having to enter the data on the table. Um, and only a couple of counties have used this, and we, we prefer that you provide the data in this table. But for some of those counties that have tons of districts, um, it can be uh, it can save them a lot of time to, to use the separate file. The distribution table will be partially pre-populated with district information. Again, we try to save you as much time as and make this as easy as possible. This, uh, the pre-populated data includes the authority, the authority's name for the district, uh, and then there's two optional fields for providing the county's name for the district or the county's code for the district, if that's helpful. If you provide those, we will pre-populate them on the next year's report to save you that uh, data entry and to make it easier for you to identify districts. Um, but you do not need to provide um, the data for these columns if it's not helpful. Uh, new districts need to be added at the, on the next rows after the pre-populated rows. Uh, this table also includes columns for reporting the DOR codes that we talked about earlier. Um, and you will then complete the two columns of distribution amounts. Um, and above line three shows the total of all the entries on the table. And if you happen to use the optional CSV file, you would have to enter those totals on line three. Just kind of overwrite the formula um, if you've attached the file. Uh, the final tab is the TIF uh, enforcement deduction tab. At the top, we carry over the total distributions from the t previous tab, and then we identify what the expected amount of TIF enforcement deductions would be. Then on line two, you're just entering um, each payment that you make to the MMB, giving the amount and the date. And if the total of all of those is off compared to the expected amount by something more than you know rounding, um, we anticipate a comment, or we appreciate a comment uh, identifying the difference. So like on this example, it's off by 11 cents. That's just rounding, no big deal. But you know, maybe if it was off um, $111, then maybe some description as to why um, would be helpful. Hopefully this reporting isn't too onerous and hopefully it actually helps you keep tabs on activity on an annual basis. It, uh, it is very valuable to us. It can be the first time we learn about a new district or a decertification, and it informs us of the actual first receipt date, which is so important for decert, decertification limits. Uh, we also use it to verify what authorities report um, when, when they report increment received or they report amounts that they've returned. Uh, we verify that uh, and compare it with this information, and sometimes we find significant discrepancies. Um, so it's very helpful. Um, it also helps us track down um, enforcement deduction payments that MMB should be sending us because we don't always get those forwarded to us. So um, please know that when you're do filling this out, you're actually providing us with very valuable information that we appreciate and use. It's not just another um, file of stuff that we may or may not care about. It's very helpful. Uh, there are a few notes to emphasize about this reporting. Um, make sure to resolve all the error messages, as I said, or the, or the submission will fail. And most importantly, please remember not to cut and paste any data into the cells. I know that might make it quicker for you, but it actually breaks the form because it breaks hidden links and blocks the data from being able to be imported. So meaning that the, it would need to be fixed or redone. So um, please enter the, the data on the tables. Um, and always, if there's a dropdown, um, always use the dropdown rather than typing the authority or district name. So if you're adding rows on the distribution table, for example, don't just type them in, um, use the dropdowns when they're available. Because um, if you type over it, again, that kind of breaks the form. Um, uh, if an authority, if you have a new district or something for an authority that's not listed in a dropdown, 
then just um, provide all that information in the comment box instead, and um, and we'll get it that way. Um, submit the file as an Excel file. And don't convert it to a PDF first. Um, do not reformat or skip lines or insert notations into the table. and you know, all that kind of stuff breaks the form for us. Um, and um, you can put any notations in the comment boxes. And also, don't include any redistributions of returned increments because, again, once they're once they're being redistributed, they're no longer tax increments. Um, and uh, make use of the comment boxes. Um, a lot of people have added comments that have been very helpful, so don't be shy about noting things. We're largely almost done, but we do wanted to call out a few resources here. So um, first, there are resources on our recently overhauled website. Um, the TIF County Guide is a critical resource for you, and it's found under the Training and Guidance tab on our website. Um, you might also find our weekly e-updates to be very helpful. If, if you haven't been getting those, um, what we do is we send out uh, little reminders, articles, uh, avoiding pitfall items, and other kind of notes related to our office as a whole. It's not just TIF, but um, the TIF division, we usually have an item in the e-update each week. Um, and so a lot of the items that we put in the e-updates relate to county responsibilities. They don't all just relate to TIF authority responsibilities, although many of them do. So if you are not signed up for the e-updates, that's just a weekly Friday email that you'd get. Um, we also have statements of position on various TIF topics on our website um, if you need to refer to those. And um, we have some training videos as well, and this webinar will be posted there soon. Um, there's also a county TIF checklist that is an appendix in the TIF County Guide. Uh, what we did is we searched statute for every mention of county officials in the TIF statutes, and we organized and accumulated uh, um, them all as best as we could with statutory references so you can efficiently review uh, that annually and hopefully make sure you have um, all the responsibilities covered. Um, so that could be a good resource for you. Um, I wanted to make sure you knew it was there. And otherwise, that concludes our training. So um, if you have any last questions, please feel free to send them our way and we'll get back to you. Uh, and please complete the evaluation. That should pop up after we close out. And we thank you so much for participating. Uh, please feel free to contact us with questions or suggestions for additional training you'd like to see from us. And other than that, um, have a great day. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.